The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. For their future security, four and a quarter million Americans are united in the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Among these members, a large number look forward to the special security provided by an equitable Independent 60s plan. Independent 60s? What sort of a plan is that? It's an equitable society plan for self-reliant people who wish to enjoy financial independence on reaching the age of 60. Does that describe you? Then you'll want to listen carefully in about 14 minutes when I give full details on the Independent 60s plan. Offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Campus Shakedown. Psychiatrically speaking, most crimes like murder, arson, and hijacking feed on the ego of the criminal. That ego tells the ordinary lawbreaker that while the overwhelming percentage of criminals is caught, he is shrewd enough to escape such fate. However, one crime feeds on the ego of the victim and on that victim's sense of pride. That crime is extortion. Fear of exposure and the consequences of such public knowledge are enough to force many people now paying extortion money to remain quiet. For one thing, they are more comfortable, since the knowledge that forms the basis for the extortion is not widespread. For another thing, the victim usually fails to press any charges after having made his payment, which allows the criminal to remain in charge of the situation, and also for him to remain in business. It is manifestly impossible, because of those and other reasons, for the Federal Bureau of Investigation to report any official total of the monies collected in the past year by those who practice this ancient crime. However, it would be safe to assume that the American people pay extortioners millions of dollars annually. Those millions of dollars are only a part, a small part, of our bill for crime. The bill which, in this past year, exceeded the total sum spent throughout the nation on education. Tonight's file opens on a baseball diamond located in a large Midwestern city. The State University squad is practicing, and in one corner of the field, a young pitcher waits for someone to catch his warm up throws. As he juggles the ball in his glove, a man approaches. Hello. Hey, hey, Chuck, you gonna catch me? Be right there, Tony. Okay. The college boy, you're not very polite. What? Oh, are you talking to me? Ah, yeah, you're Tommy Fenton, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. I'm kind of surprised you can catch a ball today. Huh? I didn't think you'd be able to stand the noise when it hits the glove. What are you talking about? Well, you should have a world's champion hangover. How do you know? I got a look at you last night. Brother, that car of yours was really weaving up Oak Lane Drive. I saw you just before it happened. Just before what happened? <laughs> are you kidding? You mean you don't remember hitting that old lady and driving off without stopping? What? Well, your license plate is 86W349, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Well, didn't you notice your headlight was broken this morning? You see the dent in the front fender? Yeah. Hey, take a look at the front page of the afternoon paper. See? Look. Police searching for hit-and-run driver. That's you. Okay, Tommy, let's get warmed up. Now, go ahead, kid. Play ball. But there's a police... Nah, guy. nobody knows you did it except me. Go ahead. Start warming up. I'll see you around.
And there is one point on which my worthy opponents can find no rebuttal. For there is none. The atomic bomb which was dropped on Hiroshima... What are you talking to, eh? (laughs) Myself. Huh? I'm practicing for the debate. Oh. Uh, Tell me, uh, what happened last night? (laughs) I'd say mainly we got drunk. I drew a big blank. Can you fill me in on what we did? I'll try. I, I know we started here... We finished your bottle of rye. That's right. And we went out to eat. Yeah, but we never got around to that. How come? Well, the drive-in was closing when we got there. We picked up a car hop. Her name was uh, Betty. And she got a friend for me. Oh. Oh, yeah. Do you remember going to Joe's Roadhouse to dance? No. <laughs> when we got there, you wouldn't get up from the table. You just kept asking the waiter to bring three drinks at a time. Oh. And all of a sudden, you told me you were taking Betty home. I walked out on you? Uh-huh. I asked you not to drive, but you said you were all right. Now, you fill me in. On what? On what happened after that. I saw your car today. Well, what about it? You try to climb a tree with it? Uh, I'll see you later, Eric. Where are you going? Out to the drive-in, see that girl? you. Hello, Betty. You got your nerve. Why? Coming around after last night. Well, what did I do? I'm too busy to play games. Well, I don't remember, honest. I've waited on bums with better manners than you had. Oh, I'm sorry. If you came to make another date, the answer is no. Uh, No, I just wanted to ask you about last night. Where did we go when we left Joe's Roadhouse? You took me home. Straight home? Sure. Where do you live? On 2nd Avenue. Don't you even remember that? No. You said you wanted to go for a ride alone out on Oak Lane Drive. I did? Yeah. At first, you wanted me to go with you. I wouldn't, so you said you were going anyway. Then you dropped me at my house and didn't even say good night. Ride with you. I got another customer. I'll be seeing you. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Policeman Larry Norwood approaches. Hiya, Jim. Oh, hello, Larry. Hey, I hear you made inspector. <laughs> That's right, last week. Congratulations. Thanks. That envelope for me? Uh-huh. I was in to see your agent in charge, and he said to give it to you. Oh, what's in it? A couple of pieces of glass and a few specks of paint. Where from? Well, the paint is from the clothes of a hit-and-run victim. We found the glass at the scene of the accident. I see. The old lady who was hit is still alive, but uh, she's in shock. And a doctor won't allow any questioning yet. Uh-huh. Uh, Jim, if you could send those to the lab and uh, get us a quick report. I'll I... get it off today, Larry. Oh, thanks. I should have a report tomorrow afternoon. I'll call you as soon as it comes in. Okay. The gardener has trouble going through his right, so get away from his gloved hand. Yes, sir. And when you're finished, go in for your shower. All right, sir. Hello, Fenton. Huh? Oh, it's you. I stuck around yesterday and watched you warm up. You got pretty good control for left handers. What do you want? Uh-huh. Got some bad news for you. About what? That accident we talked about. I call the hospital, but... Old lady's in rough shape. I know that. Oh, how? I called this morning. You didn't give me a name, did you? No. You know, it'll be tough with a kid like you. Especially if she dies. You know how drunk driving and killing somebody? Well, I gotta give you ten years anyway. You come out here to tell me that? No, no. I just want to remind you of something. What's that? I'm the only one who knows you did it. Well, you won't be. What do you mean? Made up my mind. I'm going to the police tonight. Oh? You want to pitch for the school or for a prison scene? I don't care. Well, how about your old man? Huh? I did a little checking. They tell me he's running for judge 
I'll pull you there. Uh, what about it? Well, just a... Maybe a lot of people ain't gonna vote for somebody whose kid goes around drunk, running over old ladies. Oh, now look, kid, nobody else saw you do it. You keep your mouth shut, there's no way in the world for the cops to find out unless I tell them. I wouldn't do that. Especially if you want to keep me quiet. Any reports from your lab, Jim? Yeah, Larry, it just came in. I was about to call your office and read it to you. That car you're looking for is a 1947 Buick convertible. It's painted blue, but that's a repaint job. I see. The original color of the car was black. Mm, thanks, but I'm afraid I've still got quite a job in my hands. Oh? No other leads? No, not a thing. I had the papers play up the accident, hoping some witness might call in. You see, there's not much traffic on Oak Lane Drive. Oh, pardon me, Larry. Please. Sure, Jim. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, he is. Just a minute. All right, for you. Thanks, Jim. Hello? Yes, Ralph. Oh, good. Good. Huh? She does? Uh-huh. Mm. Yeah, that'll help. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ralph. Bye. That was one of the men on my squad, Jim. He just questioned the old lady who was hit by the car. Sounded like he got some information. He did. She saw a sticker from State University on the back window of the car. Oh? And the last three digits of the license number were 383. That fits the description of the car that was used in that bank robbery last week. It might add up, Larry. Let's get to work. Sorry, mister. We're all closed for... Oh. Hi, Eddie. Get the uniform off, Betty. We're going out tonight. Where'd you get the car? I uh, rented it. <laughs> you got a new suit. Yeah. Like it? What happened? You got lucky with the horses? No. With the kid. What kid? The college boy. What'd you do? Rolling? Mm-mm. Better than that. I nosed around, found out who his old man is. He's got nothing but money. So? So I told the kid I wanted 2000 to keep quiet about the accident. And he came up with it? Oh, not the whole thing. He had 70 bucks left in this month's allowance. I took that as a down payment. When do you get the rest? Tomorrow. Gonna sell his car and hawk his jewelry. Don't I get anything out of it? Sure, baby, sure. I took your watch in to be fixed, but the guy said it was a goner, so I bought you a new one. Here. Thanks, but I... And I'll give you half of whatever we get. A thousand dollars? More than that, baby. But you just said you asked him for two. Half of two is one. I asked him for 2000 tomorrow. But that's nothing, honey. That's only the first installment. Hey. <laughs> now are you willing to admit I was right? About what? About it being the luckiest thing that ever happened. You running over that old lady. Return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now I'd like to introduce an Equitable Society member who just passed his 60th milestone. Back in 1929, Mr. Charles Wagner started an Equitable Independent 60s plan. This year, he turned over his little business to his two sons and settled down to enjoy the three freedoms that go with an Equitable Independent 60s plan. First, freedom from money worries and job worries, financial independence. Mr. Keating, it's a big kick for me when I get that check every month from the Equitable Society, and they'll keep coming as long as I live. Second, with an independent 60s plan, you're free to live anywhere you choose. We've bought us a little ranch in West Texas. <laughs> We're really living. Third, independent 60s means that you're free to do the things you've always wanted to do. Never had much chance for hunting and fishing during my working years, but I'm sure catching up now. Let me ask you this, Mr. Wagner. Why is it more people don't start equitable, independent 60s plans? Well, I figure a lot of folks are like I used to be. They think you have to be a rich man to afford a plan like that. Well, how did you learn the truth? 
from my equitable society representative. It's a fact. You don't have to earn big money to begin an equitable independent 60s plan. Ask your equitable representative to explain why you probably have a big head start towards independent 60s because of Social Security and life insurance already owned. Often only a small amount of additional insurance is all that's required. A few dollars a week did it for me. Friends, why not profit by Mr. Wagner's example? Phone your Equitable Society representative without delay. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Campus Shakedown. The Federal Bureau of Investigation does not choose the cases from its files, which are dramatized for you each week in any haphazard fashion. Each is chosen to serve a purpose, to help you in your fight against the army of American criminals. For while the men who comprise your local police and other law enforcement agencies stand as your first line of defense, this, in the last analysis, is your fight. The lessons to be learned from this evening's program are twofold, and both are equally important. The first is that this vicious crime, which finds a young college boy as the victim, need not necessarily have struck where it did. Had circumstances been different, the victim would have been someone else, for this can happen to anyone, even you. No one, whatever his location, his profession, or his temperament, is ever far removed from crime. The second point of instruction for you, the decent citizen, is equally simple. If you are currently paying an extortioner, stop immediately. If you are contemplating such payments, don't make them. Should you have any friends or relatives in either of those positions, tell them those things. For, as you have just heard, extortion is not erased by one payment, nor by any set number. It goes on so long as the victim can stand further financial bleeding. For example, one victim was known to have made regular payments to an extortioner over a period of 23 years. Before you or anyone you know becomes involved in any such position, do one thing and do it now. Go to your phone and call your local police. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office the following day. Sorry to keep you waiting, Larry. That's all right, Jim. I've just been over to the university again. Find anything that looked like the car? No, but the dean's office is getting up a list of all students owning 1947 Buicks. Well, I've had our precinct captains alert all garages and repair stations to be on the lookout in case he tries to get the car fixed. Good. We've also requested all used car dealers to notify us if any student comes in to sell a car like that. You know, of course, there's the possibility that it may not have been a student's car. Oh, but the old lady was sure she saw the sticker. Well, I sell quite a few of those during the football season to people here in town who root for the team. Mm, that's true. Say, can we uh, interview the victim yet? I told her doctor one of us would come by this afternoon. And? He said he didn't want to question more than once a day until... Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, he's here. What? Sure, go ahead. I did when? Where is he now? Hmm? Yeah. Right away. Headquarters, Larry. They said to give you a message. Oh? A young man named Fenton tried to sell a blue 1947 Buick convertible a little while ago at a used car lot over on the west side. Did they get our warning in time? Yeah, they detained him until the police arrived and arrested him. Good. Where is he? The city jail. Oh, a man who was with young Fenton ran as he saw the police approaching. Larry, will you cover the hospital? I'll go down and get his story. He might tie into that bank robbery. <laughs> job working days. She out? Yeah. Good, I gotta talk to you. You got the money? No. Why not? There's trouble. The kid's been arrested. Huh? We went to sell his car. They were waiting for us. I ran. Do, do you think he'll talk? He might. Oh, Eddie. He can't prove anything on me. Well, how about me? You're in the clear. But I... Just sit tight, baby. There ain't nobody gonna find out that you were driving that car.
Tom Fenton? That's right. Special Agent Taylor, FBI. Here are my credentials. I'll tell you everything I know, Mr. Taylor. Good. Well, the first thing is, are you guilty? Yes, sir. Fenton, I can understand you're having the accident, but what made you keep going? I can't explain it. I, I was very drunk. Well, this happened a couple of nights ago. Why didn't you report the accident after you sobered up? Well, I... I, I thought it might hurt my father. He's running for judge back home, and this kind of publicity... Won't get him many votes. Is that what you mean? Well, it's not just the election. He was kind of proud of me. You think that's reason enough? No, sir. Were you alone when the accident happened? Well, I don't know. I, I understand I was. Oh, from whom? A girl named Betty who works at the drive-in on Route 91. Mm -hmm. I was out with her that night. She said I took her home and left her to go for a ride alone on Oak Lane Drive. Maybe I did. But you don't remember? No, sir, I don't remember anything about it. Well, I'm afraid that won't be much help to you in court. I know. Then I, I came here to question you about another crime as well. Another crime? Yeah, a bank robbery. Oh, now wait a minute. I, I've confessed to the only crime I've committed. Well, I'm, I'm aware of that now. Fortunately, you don't fit the suspect's description. Oh. Fenton, I don't like to moralize but I guess you can see now what a chain of trouble you brought on yourself. I was in even deeper than you know, Mr. Taylor. Oh, what do you mean? A man saw the accident, looked me up the next day, and, and he wrote me a letter, threatened me, asked me for $2,000. Oh, no, who was this man? I don't know his name. Did you give him the money? No, sir. That's why I was trying to sell the car so I could pay him. Oh, then he's the man who ran away from the used car lot when the police arrived. Yes, sir. Would you know him if you saw him again? Oh, yes, sir. All right, then I'll arrange for you to visit the police gallery. See if you can pick out his picture. I'd like to talk to him, too. Larry, where's young Fenton's car? Uh, back in the garage, Jim. Come on. All right. Uh, what did you get from Fenton? Ali confessed to the hit and run, but the bank robbery angle fell through. Oh, he told me about a witness to the accident. Oh, I didn't think there was any. According to Fenton, this man tried to shake him down for $2,000. Mm. Did he tell you who it was? He didn't know the name, but he identified a picture in your files. Mm -hmm. Which one? And Eddie Minden. Don't think I've run into him. Well, he's strict... Go ahead, Jim. Oh, thanks. Minden's strictly petty larceny, stealing from parked cars, things like that. You think Fenton is making this up? Well, he says Minden wrote him a letter saying if he didn't pay, there wouldn't be enough left of him for the cops to find Sending that letter through the mails gives us jurisdiction. Did you see the note? A young Fenton says he misplaced it, but he thinks he can find it. Oh, here's the card, Jim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Broken headlight, and I guess this didn't offend us from the accident. Yeah, probably. It looks fresh. I think I'll get in and examine that front seat. Okay. Oh, uh, Fenton told me he was out with a girl named Betty the night of the accident. Didn't the first report say he was alone? Yeah. But the girl told him that he dropped her at her home and went for a ride by himself. Have you spoken to her? No, but I did learn of an interesting coincidence. Yeah? What's that? She works at a drive-in out on Route 91. Her boyfriend is Eddie Minden. Mm, that is interesting. Uh, what do you got there, Jim? A couple of pieces of glass I found embedded in the upholstery on this front door. Looked like they could be parts of a watch crystal. Mm, probably broke when he hit the old lady. Oh, I'm not so sure. Come on, Larry. Let's go back upstairs and talk to young Fenton. Just a minute. Oh, hi, Eddie. Hi, baby. You, you hear anything about the kid? Uh-huh. Confessed to everything. Oh, swell. I'll tell you one thing. This washes me up with them college kids. I had enough the Wait first kid. Huh? Look who just drove in. Where? Right next. Oh. Hello, Betty. Oh. Hello, Tommy. Well, I see you two know each other. I just come in for a sandwich. He's taking my order. Uh, how come you're out? Yeah, I, I heard you confess. I did. But they didn't believe me. They don't think I did it. Huh? seems they found out who was really driving my car when the old lady was hit. You did? Who was it? Betty. They're crazy. Do you want these back? 
What? These pieces of broken glass. They're from the watch crystals you broke when you hit the old lady. Eddie, a man from the FBI checked at jewelry stores and learned that your friend here brought your watch in to be fixed. Eddie, how'd he find out? Shut up, you dope. Hold it, Vivian. Hold it, or I'll fire it. Now get out of there. This is the FBI man I told you about. Now, you and the girl get in Tommy's car. We're going to headquarters. Eddie Minden and Betty Gilbert were convicted of violating the Federal Extortion Act and sentenced to ten and five-year terms, respectively. Several things caused Special Agent Taylor to doubt that Tommy Fenton had been driving the car at the time of the accident. The first was the fact that Fenton was left-handed, and in common with a great many left-handed people, he wore his watch on his right wrist. Since the broken pieces of crystal were embedded in the door to the left of the driver, they had to have come from someone else's watch. A visit to various watch repair shops produced a jeweler who recognized Eddie Minden's picture. He also remembered that Minden had brought in a lady's watch which had been smashed at exactly 2 o'clock, the time of the accident. However, Agent Taylor realized that the evidence against Minden and the girl at that point was purely circumstantial, was the type on which some juries failed to convict, for it was not until later that Minden's threatening letter was found. He therefore decided to have Tommy Fenton confront the pair with that evidence, a plan which, as you have seen, resulted in the girl's blurted confession in the arrest and conviction of two more criminals, and what is even more important, which also maintained the freedom of an innocent person. Now let's quickly review the three freedoms you can assure for yourself with an equitable, independent 60s plan. First... Freedom from money worries and job worries after your 60th birthday. Real financial independence. Second, freedom to live where you choose. Third, freedom to do the things you've always wanted to do. That's the good life you can look forward to with an independent 60s plan. Don't say you can't afford it until you've talked to your Equitable Society representative. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A dramatic account of an agent who brought a dead man back to life. It's titled, The Mercy Manhunt. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Anthony Barrett, Tom Brown, Georgia Ellis, Terry Kilburn, and Theodore Von Elf. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Mercy Manhunt on This Is Your FBI. The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, fun for the whole family, follow immediately over most of these ABC stations. Stay tuned.